Welcome to the breakout panel, Major Questions Doctrine, West Virginia versus EPA, sponsored by the Society's Administrative Law and Regulation Practice Group. My name is Aram Gavor. I'm the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs at the George Washington University Law School. And together with Lee O'Connor, who's unable to be here today, we lead the practice group. So given the 3.30 to 5 o'clock slot, I can absolutely assure you that each and every one of you who is here is intentionally here because of all the fun frivolity that's about to follow. But there's a good reason for that while you're here. That's because we have an absolute murderer's row of discussants and a top tier moderator uh, for a very important discussion. Our moderator, Judge Edith H. Jones, is a judge on the US Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit, and also the former chief judge of that court. Uh, not to belabor the introduction anymore, the inimitable Judge Jones. Thank you. The short Judge Jones. Uh, thank you all for attending, and we will try to operate this panel efficiently, because I know that all you gentlemen have to great deal of trouble getting into your tuxedos for dinner. <laughs> At the end, before I am to make an announcement for those who are pursuing CLE, we remind you that to get credit, you need to sign in and out each day, once per day. You can do this via scanning the QR codes. Uh, and if blah, blah, blah. I think you, you've heard this. <laughs> You've heard this before. Uh, I'm going to introduce a wonderful panel on a very important topic, West Virginia versus EPA and its consequences for administrative law. The first speaker will be Mr. Yaakov Roth, now a partner at Jones Day. I'm going to foreshorten their bios, which are available to you uh, in your materials. But he was the Solicitor General of West Virginia who argued the case in the US Supreme Court. Not, and I, not quite. No, not quite. No, no. I'm sorry. It's OK. I'll clarify. All right, let him clarify. Anyway, he's had a wide range of trial and appellate experience throughout the federal courts. Uh, then second, but you did clerk for Jetsy Scalia. That didn't I did. You? That okay. I wanted to take this one <laughs> The second is the inimitable professor Tom Merrill from Columbia Law School, the Charles Evans Hughes Professor of Law. He's a former deputy solicitor general. He was, I think it's interesting to know, he was a Rhodes Scholar uh, who eventually clerked for Justice Blackman, a member of the Academy of Arts and Sciences and the author of many uh, important articles and books on administrative law. The third speaker is Professor Mascot, Jennifer Mascot, assistant professor and co-executive Director of the C. Boyden Gray Center for the Study of the Administrative State at George Mason University, Antonine Scalia School of Law. And I'll put in a plug, I believe that the Boyden Gray Center produces very worthwhile uh, uh, scholarly articles and practical uh, articles about the administrative state. Uh, she has also been a Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Office of Legal Counsel. Uh, she clerked for Justice Thomas. And then finally, Mr. Ian Gershengorn, partner at Jenner and Block. He is the chair of their appellate and Supreme Court practice uh, uh, group. He has done multiple arguments in the Supreme Court. He was a principal deputy and acting solicitor general in the, in the SG's office. And he clerked for Justice Stevens. And I had another note. Oh yes, he also teaches a seminar at uh, Harvard. Uh, all these people are much more accomplished than I am in administrative law, but I think uh, the, the first one of the questions they're going to address is, is, has Chevron become the lemon test of administrative law? So let's, we'll start with uh, Professor, Mr. Roth. Thank you, thank you, Judge. Um, <clears throat> I always try not to correct a federal judge if I can avoid it, but. I can't claim to be the former Solicitor General of West Virginia. I did argue the case, but I argued it on behalf of the private petitioners who were the, the coal companies. Um, and I argued alongside uh, the uh, Solicitor General of West Virginia. So just a 
minor clarification. Um, <laughs> so since I'm speaking first, I, I'm going to just give a, an outline of the case itself, so which hopefully will make the rest of the discussion a little bit easier uh, to follow. Um, and apologies for those of you who are already very uh, well aware of all the background. Um, but I'll talk about that and then I'll just share a couple of observations from having litigated the case. So the statutory background um, is Section 111D of the Clean Air Act, which provides that the EPA is supposed to promulgate regulations under which states then set standards of performance for uh, existing sources of air pollution. And the statute defines a standard of performance as uh, the level uh, of emission reduction that is achievable through the best system of emission reduction that the EPA finds to be adequately demonstrated in light of various uh, policy considerations. So prior to 2015, um, the agency had always, the EPA had always applied that statute at a sort of what we think of as the source level. So they would ask questions like, all right, we have this type of plant. Um, if you put a scrubber on the stack, uh, then that will uh, reduce emissions by, you know, 25%, and we think that's worth the cost. Okay, that was sort of the type of analysis that was done for uh, about 40 years. Get to 2015, and the um, President's Obama, President Obama's EPA wants to address uh, greenhouse gas emissions from coal and gas-fired electricity plants. And the problem was that using that approach to the statute wasn't going to do a whole lot because those plants by 2015 were really already operating at a very efficient level. There wasn't a lot in terms of new technology that could be put on that would reduce the, the emissions further by a meaningful amount. And so instead, the agency came up with this um, alternative approach to understanding the statute and uh, embodied it in what they then called the Clean Power Plan, or CPP. And the idea that they came up with was, well, we can say that the best system of emission reduction uh, is really like an industry-wide or national scale analysis where um, if we just use coal and gas-fired electricity less, then that will reduce emissions because we won't be using those plants very much. Um, and instead, we can shift the work that they, those plants were doing to cleaner forms of energy like wind and solar and so on. And so they devised this very, very complicated uh, regulatory scheme that would use trading and credits and investments in, in you know, solar panels and all sorts of things that had nothing to do with the way the gas uh, or coal-fired plant actually operated. It was all stuff that was happening totally apart from the actual plant. So obviously that's a very, very different way of understanding the statutory authority. And it, it's, it's an approach that completely transforms uh, what the agency is doing from sort of a circumscribed engineering type problem of how can we make this plant operate more efficiently to sort of this large scale national um, public policy dis determination about, well, how much uh, of, the, of our electricity should we be generating from coal as opposed to from other sources of energy. Now, when they came out with that clean power plan, uh, the agency was challenged immediately and the Supreme Court actually stepped in and stayed it pending judicial review. So the clean power plan never took effect. That was in um, 2015 or 2016 and then uh, after the election, after President Trump uh, took over, the EPA said uh, that it was going to sort of go back to the drawing board and reconsider. And so that lawsuit actually never uh, was decided on the merits. The DC Circuit ended up dismissing it. Then took the new EPA a number of years to come up with a replacement rule, uh, which they did in, um, I think it was 2019. And uh, the, the Trump EPA said, you know, we looked at this again and we think this interpretation of the statute uh, is wrong. The way we had done it for 40 years was the right way of doing it. This is wrong. And so we are going to rescind uh, the Clean Power Plan and uh, put into place 
um, an alternative scheme called the Affordable Clean Energy Rule, or ACE, that used the more traditional uh, source-focused tools to reduce emissions. And, and there were some, but they, you know, they obviously didn't have as much of a bottom line impact as the CPP was going to have. So that came out in 2019, and, and of course the agency was then promptly sued again, this time by coalition of blue states, uh, environmental groups, and, and others. Be with me. Okay. And, um, and they said, uh, no, 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 you, you know, you're wrong now. The, the Obama EPA had it right, and this is sort of arbitrary and capricious because you're, you're not using the full scope of authority that, that was given to you in the statute. And so that then went to the D.C. Circuit, and the D.C. Circuit agreed two to one with that position and invalidated the rescission of the Clean Power Plan, right? sort of bringing the Clean Power Plan effectively back to life. So that's the decision that then gave rise to the cert petition that, that we filed and another coal company filed and uh, West Virginia Coalition and North Dakota filed cert petitions challenging that D.C. Circuit decision, which really teed up uh, the question of, well, which is the right interpretation of the statute? And I think everyone knows how that turned out. Um, we, we, uh, we prevailed in the court, and the court uh, really relied heavily in its decision on uh, what it called the major questions, canon or principle, the idea that being that um, if an interpretation of a statute uh, would give the agency you know, really significant uh, economic pa power over, over very significant economic or social political decisions, then uh, the court is going to expect a clear statement uh, to that effect in the statute and not rely on uh, ambiguity to infer that power. So that's the background on the case. Sorry for taking a few minutes with that. Um, and then I'll just, uh, I wanted to share two observations from uh, my work on the case, and then that could then launch the broader discussion. The first is a lesson that you probably don't need to learn again, but you really cannot trust the media when they describe <laughs> cases in the court. <laughs> okay. uh, there, were, there were so many uh, articles written about how this case was an example of you know, these right-wing entities and coal, big coal and so on, you know, couldn't get their way uh, you know, with, with the agency, and so they were going to the courts to try to get their preferred policy of you, you know, enshrined because of conservative court and so on. And of course, that's completely backwards. We, we didn't bring the case. It was, the case was, was brought by you know, New York, a coalition of blue states led by New York and environmental groups who said the EPA hadn't gone far enough. Um, and we only got involved in that because we were intervening to defend, the coal companies were intervening to defend the EPA decision. So the whole case would not have, would, would never have, have come to be if, um, if they had not brought that lawsuit in the first place. So they just got it completely backwards. The second lesson that I learned from it, and there will probably be a little more discussion of this uh, on the panel, but... Uh, as lawyers, I think sometimes we get a little bit too caught up in um, frameworks and tests and prongs. And, um, you know, I got asked, you know, during moots and so on, uh, and spent a lot of time thinking about whether this idea of major questions is best understood as uh, a question that you ask before you get to Chevron deference, so like a step zero type analysis, whether it's something that comes up when you're analyzing whether the statute is clear or ambiguous, which would be a step one of Chevron, whether it's something that you consider when you're asking whether the agency's interpretation is reasonable, which would be step two of Chevron. And I spent a lot of time thinking about it, and I looked at all the cases, and actually there were cases that fit into all three, you know, the court had used this idea without calling it major questions in all three ways. Um, so I couldn't really say that one was right and one was wrong. More importantly, I couldn't, I couldn't figure out, and I still cannot figure out what difference it makes, which step you, you ask this question on. I mean, it, it's basically the point is, if one reading of the statute is gonna give the agency massive new powers, then we're gonna put a thumb on the scale against that interpretation. 
Um, and you could defend that based on sort of judgment about what Congress intended. You could defend it based on constitutional principles like separation of powers. But that's really the bottom line, in my view, of what the decision held. And um, you know, the academics will tell us where it fits. But that, that's, that's my take on it. So thank you. Just going on automatically. Is your mic? Yeah, it'll be on. OK. Um, so I guess I'm the academic who is going to uh, uh, spoil uh, everything by uh, slicing and dicing all this stuff too much. Um, so uh, the last term will be remembered, among other things, for the uh, official announcement of the major questions doctrine. The, uh, um, the sort of uh, black letter uh, statement of that is that if an agency uh, is regulating in a kind of unexpected way uh, uh, an issue of major um, economic and political significance, uh, it has to point to clear authorization from Congress uh, in order to have that uh, regulatory uh, initiative upheld. Uh, a lot of questions about this. Um, I think the panel hopefully will discuss uh, what probably is on most people's mind is what exactly is this thing? And, and uh, um, Mr. Roth uh, uh, mentioned this briefly. You know, is, is it some kind of preliminary test that you, the courts are supposed to go through before they get to the question of statutory interpretation, uh, or is it just a uh, canon of uh, interpretation um, uh, that applies uh, as part of the exercise of statutory interpretation, or is it just a kind of a, a saying or a maxim like you know you don't hide elephants in mouth, mouse holes or something like that. Um, so uh, I'm not going to talk about that. I, my, my own preference would be to, to, to interpret the decision as, as really just sort of creating a new canon of interpretation, uh, but we can discuss that later. Um, another question, obviously, is this is a good idea or not. Uh, what, what, what do we think about this? Is a, it's clearly an innovation in administrative law. Do we think this is a good one or a bad one and so forth? And I'm not going to talk about that, at least initially, either. Um, uh, what I do want to mention briefly or talk about briefly uh, in a sort of preliminary way is um, what was broken uh, that led the court to think that it had to fix the system of judicial review uh, by announcing the major questions doctrine, whatever that might be, and whether we think it's good or not. Um, so, um, and I, I think this is an important question in part because it will <laughs> shed some light on the other questions. What exactly is it, and, uh, and uh, do we think it's a good idea or not? Um, uh, so uh, if you read the opinions, if you go through you know, the Roberts, Chief Justice Roberts' opinion for the court, and then Justice uh, Gorsuch's concurring opinion joined by Justice Alito, and then Justice Kagan's dissent uh, joined uh, by Justices uh, Sotomayor and Breyer, um, probably the thought you would come away with is that the major questions doctrine is a kind of a surrogate for reviving the non-delegation doctrine. Um, um, clearly, Justice Gorsuch uh, thinks uh, this is what it's all about. He, uh, his concurring opinion is filled with references to the importance of the non-delegation principle uh, and references to his uh, dissenting opinion in the Gundy case. Um, and, uh, and that's, I think, what he thinks the major questions uh, doctrine is about. Justice Kagan, in her dissent, uh, seemed to think, in the last section of her dissenting opinion, seemed to think that, yes, this is just the court's sort of sneaky way of sort of trying to um, revive or invigorate the non-delegation doctrine after failing or having not yet succeeded in doing that as a matter of straightforward constitutional law. Uh, so that's one possibility. Um, uh, but uh, I would argue uh, that something else uh, is a better explanation for what's going on, and that is that the... Uh, the major questions doctrine is, a, is the Supreme Court's partial response to perceived deficiencies in the Chevron doctrine. Uh, Chevron doctrine much lamented and, and maybe being lemonized and so forth, but uh, if you want to, there's a book out here about the history of the Chevron doctrine. Uh, uh, so of course, uh, I have to sort of uh, stand up for the Chevron doctrine as being the root cause of all this mischief. Um, but I do think there's something to this. Um, uh, now. To clarify things, there's really two different versions of the non-delegation idea. Uh, the sort of mainstream uh, non-delegation doctrine, the one that Gorsuch was talking about in the Gundy case and, and, and alludes to in his concurring opinion, 
is the idea that the Constitution, Article I of the Constitution, gives all legislative powers to Congress. And because the Constitution gives all legislative powers to Congress, only Congress can exercise that power. It can't give it away or transfer it to some other uh, entity. Uh, and if it does try to give it away to some other entity, that would be an unconstitutional delegation, which have, would have to be invalidated as a matter of constitutional law. Um, so this is a, sort of the official understanding about Article I and, and Congress's role in Article I. The Supreme Court has, in many, in many instances, uh, including some famous opinions by Justice Scalia, reiterated this idea that Congress has an exclusive power to legislate and so forth. Uh, if you look at the cases uh, that apply this idea, uh, what, what really is going on is that legislative power is understood in the kind of, a kind of a specialized sense in these non-delegation cases. Legislative power means uh, giving too much discretion uh, just to some other body of government, whether it be a, an agency or the president or a court. And so uh, the non-delegation doctrine is violated uh, when you give excessive uh, discretion to some other um, uh, entity. And uh, the way to avoid having a non-delegation doctrine is to have some kind of principle about what uh, limits discretion. So the, the orthodox one is the intelligible principle idea that every statute has to contain an intelligible principle which guides the delegate, delegatee or the court reviewing the delegatee's actions. Um, uh, Justice Gorsuch doesn't like that. He likes, better likes the idea of the distinction between important issues and details. Uh, that remains unsettled. Um, so that's one possibility. It certainly seems to be what Gorsuch thought was going on, what Justice Kagan thinks was going on. Uh, the other possibility, I think, uh, is, that, uh, is the other non-delegation idea, the other, the other sort of uh, delegation idea, which is that only Congress has the authority to delegate uh, powers uh, to uh, other branches of government, whether it be the president or, or, the, or an agency or the courts. So Congress can set up these entities, delineate their powers, and limit their powers. And this is an important constraint on our system of government uh, establishing the principle of legislative supremacy. It's not just that Congress can't give away too much discretion, but it just can't, it, whatever it gives away has to be enforced by the courts. Uh, so this idea, I think, uh, is uh, probably has better authority behind it in terms of counting the cases in the last 40 or 50 years than does the non-delegation doctrine. Uh, but there was a very important Chevron decision that was rendered in 2013, which I think helps explain uh, the major questions doctrine, which is the case was called City of Arlington versus Federal Communications Commission. And the question was, uh, the question presented was, uh, as the court, uh, the only question the court granted was, uh, does the Chevron doctrine apply to questions about the scope of the agency's jurisdiction? Uh, and uh, when the dust settled, uh, five justices led by, of all people, Justice Scalia said, yes, uh, if a statute's ambiguous, if it's not clear, if there's a gap or whatever in the statute, if it's vague, um, then the agency uh, can decide the scope of its authority and the court has to apply the deferential Chevron doctrine to that determination. Um, uh, this always struck me as uh, really, really wrong. Uh, uh, Chief Justice Roberts wrote a very impassioned dissent in that case, uh, saying it was really, really wrong. Um, and uh, he was joined by Justices Alito and Kennedy. So, uh, uh, but I think everybody that in the case ultimately agreed with Scalia that this distinction between jurisdiction and non-jurisdictional was very uh, impossible, really, to implement in any kind of consistent or predictable way. So. I think he basically won over the court with that argument. Um, but I think Justice Roberts was left thinking, well, this can't possibly be right. There has to be some kind of way for courts to enforce the limits that Congress has placed on the administrative state, on administrative agencies. And I would hypothesize to you that um, Justice Roberts' uh, authorship of the majority opinion in uh, West Virginia represents his effort to undo, at least in significant part, City of Arlington versus FCC. Uh, that Justice Roberts perceived in his careful, crafty style uh, that he could get six votes for an opinion uh, endorsing the major questions doctrine. He could entice Justice Gorsuch and his allies to join that. Um, and that the, at least with respect to major questions, uh, uh, courts will now have uh, uh, unfettered independent authority to decide uh, whether the agency is or is not exceeding the scope of its delegated authority. Uh, 
Um, so I think that is my explanation for what the court, at least what the majority and what Chief Justice Roberts perceived to be what was broken that needed to be fixed was the inability of courts to constrain uh, and reinforce the limits on agency authority. Uh, uh, and what he was able to come up with was the major questions doctrine. You might ask, well, why not just overrule City of Arlington? Well, City of Arlington was authored by Justice Scalia, kind of icon of the conservative movement, as you all know. Uh, Justice Thomas joined that opinion, still sitting on the court. And I think everybody agreed that the jurisdictional, non-jurisdictional distinction really wasn't very workable. Uh, uh, so I don't think that was a very pl plus it was, you know, it's hard to overrule a statutory, supposedly non-constitutional decision. So um, the major questions doctrine is what Roberts comes up with to uh, undo uh, the disaster of City of Arlington versus FCC. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Berry can go on. Uh, I think Professor oh, Mascot. I'm it? sorry. <laughs> Thanks for the, to the Federalist Society for hosting this event and coordinating the panel and to Judge Jones for moderating. Um, so I'm going to be a little bit of a counter voice, I suppose, in suggesting that perhaps this decision really did not affect all that big of a change or create an entirely new doctrine. And partly because the court is claiming and contending the opinion that the major questions canon has always sort of existed at least over the past 20 years. But I think because there are ways to potentially read the opinion in its best light as trying to essentially be consistent with textualism um, and formalism while using some colorful language. So I'll, I'll explain that in a minute. Um, but as a cynic, from a practical standpoint, I think what will happen with this opinion, will it bring about a big change in doctrine in finding many more regulations unlawful? I think the court wants to be able to review regulations closely, take a more careful look at statutory interpretation and agency behavior. And I agree with Professor Merrill that um, I definitely read this decision and a lot of the court's recent jurisprudence in the last five to 10 years as being oriented toward taking a more trenchant, formalist, textualist approach to interpreting statutory authority. But I think the way in which the chief wrote this opinion with major questions doctrine, at the end of the day, all it's going to really do is give the court another tool another canon, another set of words to, to, to use when it wants to find a regulation to be unlawful, and that it's going to be very challenging based on the lack of clarity in the opinion itself about what constitutes an issue of major economic and political significance, what does it mean for a statute to speak clearly. The court actually didn't spend very much time um, defining those concepts, giving us a lot of detail, so it's not going to be a very easily administrable test. And it will come into play, I think, when the court thinks there's a significant enough statute and it wants an extra reason or principle to use to say that the agency is acting outside of its statutory authority. If I'm incorrect, and, this, and the opinion is really to be read strongly to, to say that um, there's a new canon and you look at statutes differently when they're involving issues of economic and political significance, I think that would be quite negative because, I mean, as a formalist, I guess... If I, I sort of think that if a statute authorizes an agency to um, regulate in an area that has significance, then the agency has authority to do so unless there's a constitutional concern. If the statute's narrow, we interpret it narrowly, and we don't necessarily need a special interpretive tool telling us to take a different, use a different lens with our textualist interpretation based on how significant um, the statute is. Um, and then also if the stat if the canon is saying that the that the statute needs to be clear in the traditional clear statement sense, which sometimes in the past has been interpreted to mean that the statute has to explicitly authorize the particular program or approach that the agency is looking at. I also think that would be a little bit um, too heavy and forward leaning because again, statutes obviously are trying to give some kind of general, hopefully clear, but general rule of the road moving forward. I don't think, but I don't read the chief's um, language to be necessarily um, creating a new clear statement rule. I think instead what the opinion is doing is it's somewhat tautological about how does one interpret a statute when an agency is trying to exercise new authority or engage in big, um, big things. And I think if the opinion's read to sort of, um, I mean, and, and I guess actually I should back up and say, I think it probably if one is a conservative in, this, in the sense of wanting um, agencies to have to cue closely the statutes and in a jurisprudential sense, it would probably have been a better, stronger opinion, perhaps, if the court had not engaged in any of the major questions language. Because if the court, without any canon, without any thumb on the scale, 
would have just said, no, we're looking at the statute for what it says, and it does not authorize the EPA to regulate in this way, consistent with what um, Mr. Roth was saying earlier, then it would have actually, I think, authorized and just made very clear that the court's going to, across the board, take a very trenchant um, approach to statutory interpretation and try to always be making sure that agencies are only acting consistent with their authority, looking contextually at the statutory scheme, not just the words to see, is this a new it's what a system mean or standard, but in the context, does the EPA generally have authority to be doing this, like the approach the court took in the OSHA VAX case? Um, nonetheless, it, it didn't do that. It used the major questions language. But what does it really mean? I mean, I think what the court is essentially saying is that um, particularly when it's an important issue and an agency is exercising authority that previously it has not given any indication in the 30 or 40 years under the statute that it believes that it has, the court's going to take a close look at what the terms say. It's not going to give any deference. It's going to um, try to make sure that the statute does, by its terms, authorize the, authorize the, um, the um, activity. And that that sort of a general approach could be seen to be consistent, I, I suppose, with traditional or historical textualism. And the court's saying, no, when agencies are... are identifying or coming up with new authority, being creative, moving outside the box, doing major things, the court is going to be particularly careful and trenchant to look at whether it's consistent with the statutory text. To the on discussion about whether this is going to operate as a non-delegation canon, so I, I, I agree with question, much of what Professor Merrill said. So as, as you all know, the, the classic non-delegation claim would be that only Congress can legislate. And if it's um, legislates a statute that is so broad and so absent and devoid of any governing standard, then what it has done is essentially authorize agencies to engage in lawmaking and creating new binding rules on the public that we only want the, electoral account the electorally accountable folks in Congress representing districts and states across the country to be involved with and to have come up with. Um, and will this major questions doctrine be another way to raise that constitutional challenge? I actually read Justice Gorsuch's opinion to very much be sticking with a non-delegation idea, but I kind of almost read it as perhaps a concession or a hesitance that the rest of the court has not yet come around to Justice Thomas's <clears throat> and Justice Gorsuch's view on the constitutional claim, does not yet seem willing to replace the intelligible principle standard for legislation with something else. And what he's saying is regardless of what you think about the constitutional claim, the constitutional claim is just simply speaking the reality that it's up to Congress to legislate and come up with standards. And so to the extent that we um, want to have a background principle or this understanding that it's the legislators who are supposed to be regulating or coming up with governing rules, we're going to be predisposed to think in a statute that the statute is only, only authorizing the behavior that could clearly be discerned from the text of the statute. And so it's he's using it sort of as an interpretive canon, perhaps, maybe a reason to have a clear statement rule, but essentially saying this more trenchant view, making the agency hew more closely to the statutory text is itself just derived from the constitutional structure and the role of the legislature. And so whether you wanna see it as a constitutional claim or not, we need to be reading statutes narrowly, consistently with their terms. Um, and I think, I, so I think this will be another tool in the toolbox for folks who want to find agency action unlawful. Um, I think, however, it can be um, it can be seen as consistent with textualism. And I suspect that the reason why the opinion lacked a little bit of clarity is simply because it needed to get you know majority support. And so some of the justices, for example, Justice Thomas and Gorsuch might have written a very different opinion than the chief. But this was the one that was drafted and garnered the majority votes. Thank you. No, it's okay. Sure, and uh, thanks everyone, it's great to be here. So I, I am gonna address, I think, from a non-academic perspective, the question of whether this is a big deal. And um, I guess my sense is that it is, um, that, you know, that efforts to kind of say, as the chief did, this is for extraordinary cases, um, and this isn't really nothing to see here, it's not any different than things we've been doing before. Why, that doesn't really seem to me to be right, um, you know, as, as a litigator in the real world. And I, there's sort of four points that I guess I would make. 
First, um, I think it's a mistake to view this case in isolation. Um, what you really have from the court is in the course of 15 months striking down the CDC eviction ban, the OSHA vaccine mandate, and then West Virginia v. EPA. And when the court strikes down major federal initiatives three times in the course of basically a little over a year, I think it's fair to say that something big is going on there. And I think that for a couple of reasons. I mean, one of the things that the court's opinions do is they have a signaling function, right? The court only takes 60 cases a year. It can't possibly uh, address all of the issues that are coming up. And so the court's, um, the court's decisions, when they're going in a particular direction, send messages. And they send messages to at least two audiences, right? They send it first to lower court judges um, who are getting and going to get the message that there's, there are, there's a major questions doctrine that you need to take seriously. And that's going to happen mm -hmm. until we get a case where the court says, actually, you applied the major questions doctrine, and that was wrong. Like, mm -hmm. that was too broad. The other signal is to litigators, right? To like me and Mr. Roth, right? We have gotten the message that this is a path to victory for our clients. And when the court says this is a path to victory, you take that seriously, right? Um, and, and so that's something we're looking at. And I think the signaling function is exacerbated here by, by, by the context in which the case arose, which is to say a situation in which there was a serious question about mootness. The court easily could have ducked this case. Um, and so maybe the court was motivated by sort of the EPA and wanting to, you know, cabin the EPA. But I take it as a situation in which the court easily could have gotten rid of the case and instead used it as an opportunity to sort of formalize an idea that, that certainly Justice Gorsuch had been pushing and that the court had itself had recognized. And if you think about this sort of signaling idea and you think about, say, the Second Amendment, I mean, you think about in the wake of Heller and McDonald where the court was denying cert, denying cert, denying cert, and Justice Thomas is saying you know, this is a second class right. You know, that sends a signal, right, to the lower courts. Like, you can really, you have some room here to uphold some Second Amendment statutes, and we're not going to bother you, uh, you know. Now, of course, the court has sent a very different signal in Bruin, and, you know, that message, I think, resonates. I, mean, I, don't, I won't speak for Judge Jones, <laughs> but my sense as a litigator, certainly in bringing claims, um, is that this is a message that the court has sent, um, you know, I think in intentionally, but at the very least, effectively. The second point, and, and I think this has been touched on a couple of times, is that it's going to be a lot easier to strike down rules, I think. Um, the court has all, courts have already invoked West Virginia v. EPA in the very short time it's been around as a bolster for striking down DACA um, and at least two other vaccine mandates, and we're only three or four months in. When I think about the kinds of things that are at issue, like so one that seems to me the easiest example comes around is net neutrality, right? It's been back and forth to the courts every time the administration changes, the FCC uh, flips, and I think as soon as they get a third vote, they may try again. Like that's the easiest major questions doctrine case you're going to see. And I wish I could say it's because I'm brilliant and analyzed it, but it's because Judge Kavanaugh, then Judge Kavanaugh, now Justice Kavanaugh, decided that in the DC Circuit. Right? He said the last time net neutrality came up, this is a major question. And he went through basically the same analysis that the court did in West Virginia v. EPA. Um, the SEC disclosure rule, clearly, I, I'm not saying that's clearly going to lose, but clearly is going to draw a major questions <coughs> doctrine. Um, I can, uh, I'm sure that, that Mr. Roth is seeing the same thing. When I go talk to clients about this case, they immediately start going through every regulation they are subject to and thinking, boy, that's a major question. <laughs> that is costing me a boatload of money and I don't know where they get that authority. Um, and Congress didn't say it. So like, and then, you know, picking up on something Professor Mascott said, you know, there's gonna be a lot of litigation about this. I mean, what, what then Judge Kavanaugh, what Justice Kavanaugh said in the net neutrality case is, he said, "This is an I know you. I know it when you you know it when you see it doctrine, and you know you know it when you see it. Doctrines are the kind of things that you have to work out in litigation because they're not going to be crisp and, and clear rules." The third reason why I think it's important, on a, just as a practical level, is that it's coming against the backdrop of congressional inaction. When you think about how these court rules play out in practice, think about how different the major question doctrine would seem as, you know, whether good or bad, just in effect, if Congress were regularly cranking out legislation 
um, you know, in a sort of bipartisan way. And then you would get the EPA rule. Congress would say, thank you for the direction. We're now gonna make the policy judgment you've asked us to make, and we're gonna pass legislation, and now it's gonna go, and we may go further than the EPA wanted. We may, we may be actually closer to where the court ended up, but you get some dialogue, this interbranch dialogue that is so important um, in this area. And none of that, of course, is happening. Right? And the midterms you know, from Tuesday show us that's not going to change for at least the next two years. Right? And so doctrines like the major questions doctrine seem to me extraordinarily important um, in the real world, given the state of Washington, you know, given the, not the state of Washington, but the <laughs> this, how DC is functioning. Um, and um, you know, so I take seriously um, Justice Gorsuch's observations that the framers wanted legislation to be hard. Um, and you know, he clearly, he views that as a feature, not a bug. Um, but I think there are ways to see you know, the current gridlock as maybe you know, not functioning the way the, the framers necessarily were, were thinking. Um, and in any event, regardless of whether good, bad, or how foreseen, um, I think it's a real effect. And then the final way I think it's real, having been um, in the government on this, is I think it actually has a, a pretty significant impact on agencies. Um, you know, agencies are, it doesn't always seem that way, um, but agencies get legal advice. Um, you know, OLC is weighing in, the agency lawyers are weighing in, DOJ is weighing in. Rulemaking, it's extraordinarily burdensome to receive the rule in as a company, for <clears throat> sure. But it's also, it takes a tremendous amount of agency resources. And one of the things you need to do as somebody in the administration is just decide, is this worth it, right? Am I gonna go through the, you know, the, the Clean Air Act, you know, going through all of this rulemaking and litigation, knowing at the end of the day where it's headed. You think about, again, net neutrality, right? The FCC starts that the last time they did it, I forget, it was like 5 million comments that just, Justice Kavanaugh said, and I think the time before it was like 20 million comments. Like, do they want to sort through all that, knowing that this is going to be their major focus for the next X years? This is going to be their singular regulatory accomplishment knowing that it's headed to a court where it seems certain to lose on major questions doctrine. And so I think like there's a lot of, um, of self-censoring that goes on, or maybe your lawyers tell you as an agency official, you should, be not, you should not be doing this in terms of prioritizing. And so I think it has a decision like this and, and a series, what I think is really a series of decisions like this, has a tremendous effect on how agencies think about their own power and what they think they can get accomplished in the short time that the political appointees have while they're there. I'll just, before we go to, I'll just have one comment, Mr. Groshengorn. If it were really that uh, great a rule to self-censor agencies, I would be totally in favor of it. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think it will work that way. Uh, any, I, they will go around for the panel to take comments briefly, like three or four minutes on each other. Oh, to respond to, to one another? Yeah. Um, sure. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, on the last point, you know, I think, <laughs> I think at least some of the agencies have missed the memo even since June. Mm -hmm. you, know? <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm not sure the Department of Education got it or read it very carefully. You know, I could give you some other examples. I guess that's good, good for lawyers like us who like challenging rules, but... Um, not sure. Um, I, I, I generally agree, I, mean, I, I agree with everybody, I guess. I, um, I think that there's an aspect, uh, there's certainly an aspect of cutting back on Chevron that was, that was uh, at play in the decision uh, or giving it some, uh, some boundaries, as Professor Merrill said. I think there's obviously constitutional you know, backdrop to all of this. Um, so, I, and again, I'm, I'm not sure there's, between the two theories, I don't know, I haven't identified yet what the practical difference would be, and probably the truth is that it's a mix of both. Um, but, yeah, no, I, I, I generally share those, share those views. I agree with a lot of what was said as well. I guess I'll take the opportunity to answer Judge Jones's initial question, which is, does the uh, decision in West Virginia versus EPA or the state of the court's jurisprudence mean that Chevron is like the lemon test, meaning that it's basically gone without the court saying so. Although if it were really going to follow the lemon path, we would be told 
in three or four years that Chevron hasn't been a legitimate doctrine for, for about a decade. And we all miss 30, memo. 40 years. Um, but no, certainly, I, I definitely think the court is shying away from Chevron. I do agree with Professor Merrill, this is cutting it back, but I don't think they seem to have much intention of applying it in the future in the first place. And I guess when I say this is um, not affected a big, big change, I think I mean like theoretically and methodologically and as an interpretive matter, this is not necessarily an intention to be a big move away from textualism. It is absolutely being applied um, as correctly as Mr. As Gershengorn said to find unlawful many rules. But I would submit that's because the Biden administration is doing some very forward leaning, broad, um, atextual, unlawful things, and not because the court's changing its approach to interpretation, if I can make a controversial statement. Uh, a few things. So um, I, I read, reread the opinions on the train coming down from New York earlier today. Um, and, and I tend to, I, I, I hope Jennifer's right. I, I hope that what this uh, major questions doctrine amounts to is sort of like a new maxim of interpretation or a new uh, saying uh, like uh, no elephants in mouse holes. I would call it a red flag that courts, you know, should be alerted to uh, engaging in more careful review of an agency's authority uh, when uh, the conditions of the major questions doctrine appear to be present, you know, a big deal case that's sort of uh, unanticipated or, or unprecedented by, by agency, prior agency action. I think that would be a very helpful change in the law. Uh, but there are overtones, certainly the, the Gorsuch concurrence uh, and I think Kagan's interpretation of what's going on is that this is some kind of clear statement rule that has to apply before you get into the exercise of interpretation, kind of a step minus one of the Chevron doctrine or something like that. Uh, um, uh, if that is what the court has in mind, I think it's not a good idea. I think it would be, in fact, a disaster. Uh, uh, so I think uh, it's too early to be uh, celebrating or condemning. I, 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 the thing I, I'm impressed by in rereading Robert's opinion is he never uses, he never himself uses the phrase clear statement once. He does refer to other, you know, the EPA actually used the clear statement in its, in its rulemaking, the, the Trump EPA. But Roberts himself does not invoke the clear statement idea. He talks about the need for clear authorization by Congress. And of course, all the authority that Roberts cites are, are, are snippets from prior Chevron cases, exclusively. It's really coming out of that whole body of jurisprudence. And so I, I hope what this means is that what we have now is sort of like a, a beefed up version of elephants and mouse holes, which now been elevated to the level of like a standard maxim of statutory interpretation, a new chapter in the Garner and Scalia book about interpretation canons and so on and so forth. Uh, and I think that would make a lot of sense because what courts are good at is interpreting uh, statutes and constitutional provisions. They're not good at telling us whether something is a major question in the abstract or not. I mean. If you if you, if the, if what the court has to do is to decide whether or not you know uh, it's politically controversial, or large number of people are affected, or large number of dollars are affected, or you know uh, con this is an issue that Congress tried to resolve but was unable to resolve, and so forth, they're ba we're basically asking them to engage in political punditry of some sort, uh, which courts are not well uh, suited to doing, and I think that would be very unfortunate. It would be uh, to your point uh, in. Uh, uh, utterly unpredictable for agencies, courts advising, uh, uh, lawyers advising clients and so forth as to what, what is a major question and isn't. If it's going to be a sort of seat of the pants, all things considered, I know it when I see it type of inquiry, then um, uh, uh, there's going to be massive uncertainty about this doctrine. Uh, uh, the lower courts are going to go different ways on different issues. The Supreme Court does not have the capacity to straighten all this stuff out. Um, and uh, I sincerely hope that's not what, what what this evolves into because I think it's gonna create a huge jurisprudential mess. I sort of wish that Justice Scalia were still around to offer us a lecture about the importance of rules rather than standards uh, in, in because uh, the legal system depends on there being uh, clear principles and rules as opposed to uh, multifactorial tests that have uncertain weights and so forth. I, I, if you add the Gorsuch concurrence with the Roberts opinion, I come up with eight different factors that are arguably <laughs> relevant to deciding whether or not something is a major question or not. 
Um, and and uh, there's no metric as to what respective weight these factors are given and so forth. And, and I, I cringe to think what this might, might lead to. So I think the, I think it's a bad news for uh, agencies. I think it's bad news for lower courts. It's, it's probably good news for lawyers uh, advising their clients. Uh, um, the other point I would make is that uh, uh, what about people that are affected by minor questions? Uh, exactly. There are all sorts yes. of there are all sorts of people out. This is the Chevron yes. bias problem, which I I don't highlight as much as my colleague Philip Hamburger does, but. <laughs> Um, this is a very real problem, and you know there was this case that uh, uh, was denied earlier this week uh, with a 16-page dissent by Justice Gorsuch about uh, the Department of Veteran Affairs and the Veterans Affairs Court applying Chevron to deny somebody their benefits because you know of some uh, um, interpretation by the Veterans Administration that didn't seem to have any statutory authority. This is not a major question by any by any account, right? Some poor veteran gets screwed out of his benefits. Uh, but if the agency was acting improperly outside of the scope of its delegated authority, uh, 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 there needs to be legal redress for those people. Uh, and so uh, the court hasn't said, you know, what the poor schmucks that are affected by minor questions are supposed to do in the future. Um, uh, my answer would be that everybody's entitled to judicial review to see if the agency is acting within the scope of its authority as, as actually delegated by Congress. And that this major question is not going to be a useful red flag to apply in under, uh, undergoing an analysis like that. But to cut it off as some kind of preliminary inquiry uh, requiring a, a clear statement before we even get into statutory interpretation, I think is going to create a holy mess. And then I'll just follow up on the, the lemon question. I mean, I, the way I think about it is, you know, in the lower courts, I don't think it's quite reached the lemon stage yet. Um, I think you can win and win consistently, for example, in the DC circuit on Chevron, and I wouldn't hesitate to do it. In the Supreme Court, it's the last argument on the last three pages of my brief, right? The, you are not gonna win in this Supreme Court with a robust version of Chevron, and so it might as well be where the lemon test is, right? You need to win on you know, where we are with sort of our deference. You need to show every tool of statutory construction renders this unambiguous in your favor and then you know you throw in at the end um, and Chevron would have the same result for anti against Chevron and so um, you know I think in the Supreme Court it's pretty close to lemon but I don't think it's reached that stage in the lower courts yet. I want to add just a point before we get to questions here about the fact you know seeing these cases from the bench as I have been for a number of years uh, what, what strikes me are a couple of things. One of them is that we have seen a ratcheting back and forth of, ex of interpretations of administrative regulations that is probably unprecedented in the last 15 years or so, where precedents and understandings that were three or four decades old were suddenly overturned by one administration. The next, I mean, we had an argument with a fellow over wetlands uh, that has been in dispute now for well over 10 years, and the regulations have changed three times. And at some point, this it's not funny. These are people whose businesses depend on this stuff. And you what you have is these extraordinarily aggressive agencies that have decided that they're going to make law because Congress can't do it. And so, in a sense with making a long story short, major questions is supposed to say, stop doing that. That being said, as a formalist, I don't want to be the first judge in the country to overturn something solely on the basis that this is a major question. I would use elephant and mouse hole to fortify my major questions analysis. But the point is, uh, re regulatory adjudication is very difficult. And more often than not, we are getting uh, less than total briefing on the very difficult regulatory issues, Fair Labor Standards Act, labor law, uh, the fiduciary rule. We've had a number of these in our court. And I just urge all the lawyers, many of whom are my friends or whom I, who I know by reputation in this audience, you've got to get into the details. Uh, of the regulations, the regulatory history, the background, and then present those in a compelling way to the court, in which case major questions will quite often become unnecessary. 
Professor Merrill wrote a very series of interesting commentaries on West Virginia where he pointed out that the court could have decided the case on statutory grounds. Now, obviously, they had a different goal in mind, which I'm not, I'm not prone to second guess. But, you know, that, that's the kind of thing that lower courts need to know about. So, Judge, can I jump in? Yeah, because you raised such an interesting dilemma, I think, for, for those of us who practice. So, you, you know, you heard the judge say, like, she wants a detailed discussion of the reg and the history and what's going on. And I, and I, totally, I totally respect that. And, and as an advocate, I want to meet that. But you read West Virginia v. EPA, and you know, Justice Kagan says you don't see the statutory text until page 29 of a 31-page opinion. Right. And we are schooled over and over. And as advocates, like page one of my Supreme Court brief is like the text. Here's what the statute says. Now, what am I supposed to do in the Supreme Court now with this doctrine? Right. Do I start with this is the biggest rule you have ever seen? Um, you know, this affects X millions of dollars. Do I have my economist come in and, you know, sort of again, like schooled over and over like we're not looking at post post enactment legislative history. Oh my God, right? That's like the lowest of the low. But what is the court doing in major questions to figure out whether this is a major question? It's looking to see whether Congress tried to pass this legislation, the same thing after the statute was done and yet failed and then draw inferences from that about, oh, that must mean that Congress didn't want it and the agency is just trying to do what Congress couldn't get done. That's fine. That's a permissible sort of inference. But boy, that's not what we've been litigating for the last two decades, right? About how you think about post enactment legislative history to draw from that the inference that Congress wanted the policy, could have had the policy and chose not to, as opposed to Congress thought the agency already had it. Somebody attached a rider to the bill that then killed it. That, you know, I go on and on, and folks who do ledge could give much better examples. But we're being asked as part of this analysis. Um, to focus on a lot of things that, you know, we've been told over the last few years are not really part of the, the focus. And so I think it's really interesting to, I feel a little more tension, I think, than maybe, than maybe you do between what the court is saying here about what matters and, uh, you know, and what we've been hearing matters and what Judge Jones just said to her matters, which I think is, you know, at the end of the day, that's what I want to know if I'm in the Fifth Circuit. Um, but I, I'm getting a different message from this case from the Supreme Court. Like if I were thinking, how do I start my brief you know, uh, on a case like like that Jacob brought here, I, it's not going to be. Here's the text of eleven to ten or one eleven. By the way, we we did start with the text. Right, just for the record, I know, but, there's a, but the that's because you didn't have West Virginia v. EPA. Well, right? well <laughs> I don't know what you would right, today. I wouldn't but, today. I would say uh, the EPA has just taken over the largest sector of the economy with a massive attempt to to regulate under the guise of you know, regulating factories has just required plants to stop, you know, it'd be something like that. So, right? so, so I, anyways, I, I find it very tricky as an advocate and, and don't find it as straightforward. If I could just add something to that, you know, I, it, the way I see it, this, the major question analysis is not something you do in the abstract of asking, is this, is this policy question a big deal or not? To me, you always have to start with, there are two interpretations of the statute that are being proffered and we're deciding between them. And to me, it's a, almost more of a relative analysis, right? You have this, you have interpretation A, which leaves the agency to do X and Y and it's circumscribed. And then you have interpretation B, which relative to A is this massive expansion. And in those circumstances, we're gonna prefer A over B. So I don't think you can really divorce the sort of significance of the question from the, the task of interpretation that the court is ultimately doing. All right, is it time for questions? Uh, I'm not sure who's been there the longest. Maybe you have. Hi. Um, so in thinking about the major uh, questions doctrine, I, I thought it really paralleled this statement. Uh, the line has not been exactly drawn, which separates those important subjects, which must be entirely regulated by the legislature itself from those of less interest. The line has not been exactly drawn, basically says this is not a bright line rule. There is kind of fuzziness going on here. And just like, I like bright line rules and that's what the court is saying, this is not a bright line rule. But that's exactly what Chief Justice Marshall said. And when you compare important subjects or major questions, 
I mean, to me, these things are saying the same thing, that you have to look at whether these things are big and important enough that this has to be decided by the legislature. And to me, there's very little difference between what the court said in West Virginia EPA and what Chief Justice John Marshall was saying. Now, maybe the court may not have been ready to say, we are grounding this doctrine in the non-delegation doctrine like uh, Gorsuch was. But at the same time, it wasn't saying and you know, this is just uh, statutory interpretation or some other basis for it. Um, and I'm at least hopeful that they will ground it in that language from Chief Justice John Marshall. And so I was wondering if the panel's thoughts Are on that Are you asking someone in particular? No, I just wanted to hear the panel's thoughts on that. I guess, they, I guess they're thinking about it. <laughs> All right, Nick, over here. Oh, my uh, question is John McGinnis. Uh, Speak uh, up, please. Sorry, John McGinnis, Northwestern, um, uh, is to be a devil's advocate, uh, maybe like the last speaker, asking about whether we be better understand this as a non-delegation issue. Because after all, uh, even before uh, West Virginia v versus the EPA and the other cases, we had King versus Burwell. So already we have um, the idea that there are major questions that the court will not follow Chevron with respect. What this adds is some requirement of clear authorization, at least thumb on the scale, that I think is not so much an article uh, uh, two, artic uh, article uh, uh, two, uh, article, I'm sorry, article three, article two d dispute, like Chevron and how much we're going to uh, make our own decisions, but more an article, um, uh, one, Article 2 uh, 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 question, how much uh, are we going to uh, infer uh, that uh, authority has been given to the executive branch? And so we're giving, putting the thumb on the scale, and that goes to the non-delegation doctrine. Let me just say very briefly why I think this responds to a problem uh, that the non-delegation doctrine would create. If we had a, a full non-delegation doctrine, that would apply to minor questions. It would create huge issues throughout the government. It would um, also apply perhaps to new, uh, to, to settled major questions, whereas this, this, this uh, doctrine only goes to new unexpected uses of major uh, uh, authority by the agency. So for these reasons, and then finally it gives the uh, Congress a way to come back in a way the Constitution non-delegation doctrine would not. So for all of these reasons, it responds to a problem that uh, people have if they're worried about the non-delegation doctrine and the difficulty of reviving it. And so that's the better interpretation. I'm not making a normative argument, the better interpretation of what they're trying to do here. Any comments? Well, if I follow that, I think I agree. I mean, I, I think the... Um, I don't think the, the clear statement idea makes any sense at all with respect to the classic non-delegation doctrine. The classic non-delegation doctrine is based on the, pos the postulate that only Congress can legislate, and it's invalid for Congress to transfer that power to another entity, and you can't couple that with a clear statement rule that says, but if Congress has a clear statement, of course they can transfer their power to another entity. That, that doesn't make any sense. I think the idea that Congress can, has exclusive authority to delineate the powers of agencies uh, uh, does make sense when coupled with a clear statement doctrine. So to that extent, I think that, that was why I was trying to argue, however inarticulately, that I think the, the, the fallout from City of Arlington is a much better explanation for the, the clear statement doctrine than the non-delegation issue is. I largely agree with uh, Professor Merrill here. I mean, it's, it's clearly, clearly they're sort of suggesting that in theory, Congress could delegate broad authority to do generation shifting regulations or whatever. Um, but I, I mean, they obviously seem predisposed not to prefer that. They're certainly not going to infer a statute authorizing such a broad effectuation transfer of power unless it's clearly doing so. I, I agree with um, Professor McGinnis that the court is responding to non-delegation concerns. And I think essentially what it's doing is because it is sort of motivated to be concerned that we've got old broad statutes on the books that agencies are using in new unprecedented ways. It's not going so far as to say that's a constitutional issue, but because it's Congress's job as a constitutional matter to legislate, it's going to be particularly trenchant in those areas. I guess I just also join with Professor Merrill and, hope, and Judge Jones, I think, in hoping that 
every time there's a lawful problem with an agency action, the court's going to be trenchant in its interpretation and not use more kid gloves through Chevron or any other differential scheme just because it's not sufficiently major under as some as yet undefined test. All right, over here. Mark Chenoweth with the New Civil Liberties Alliance. Uh, Mr. Buffington was our client, and uh, you're, you're right that uh, the agency did not do, uh, do well by him. I wanted to read a couple of sentences from the dissental that Justice Gorsuch uh, wrote and, and, and get your reaction to them, uh, uh, Mr. Gershon Gorn or, or perhaps Professor Merrill. Uh, he said, the aggressive reading of Chevron has more or less fallen into desuetude. The government rarely invokes it, and courts even more rarely rely upon it. The Federal Circuit's decision at issue here is thus something of an outlier, and maybe that is a reason to deny review of this case. Maybe Chevron maximalism has died of its own weight and is already effectively buried. I'm just wondering what universe is the Supreme Court living in if it thinks that Chevron has fallen into desuetude? Because I think what, what Mr. Gershengorn said is absolutely right. In the lower courts, you can win on this every day and twice on Sunday. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, maybe it's wishful I thinking. Agree. Yeah, no, I, I think you're right. I mean, I think that the, we are. This is why I don't think we're in lemon land. I mean, I, I think that we got to a point with lemon where no court, you know, Supreme Court or lower court would really invoke it, you know, except maybe, you know, at the tail end of, of an opinion. But I just don't think we're there yet in Chevron, but it's precisely the language that that you say. And I read, I, you know, I read the opinion before coming up and, I, you know, I had the same reaction like you don't want to be standing up in this court saying this is an easy case under chevron like because <laughs> that's an oxymoron right for this for the court and so you're not there but i you know if i'm in the dc circuit uh, that's exactly what i'm saying and you know i i think i think that that makes it this is like a plug for uh, for for the man who literally wrote the book on chevron right i mean I, this makes it an unstable equilibrium right now right i mean this is not where lemon was where it kind of drifts away because the cases will have to come up. There are gonna be presumably DC circuit cases that that invoke the, the Chevron doctrine and they're gonna get up there. But I, 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 it's just a, it's an unstable equilibrium as best I can say it. I mean, one point that I would make is it seems to me that the Chevron doctrine was largely a doctrine for the lower courts. Uh, one of the things I argue in the book is that the uh, primary explanation for the, the spread of the Chevron doctrine, it's great popularity for 35 years is that the lower courts liked it because it was much cleaner and more simple and straightforward than having to delve into legislative history or look at all the five different factors that prevailed before Chevron and deciding whether an agency's interpretation was good or bad. Um, and so uh, Chevron was very much a doctrine that was promulgated uh, initially by the lower courts, the DC Circuit, Supreme Court adopted it, but the Supreme Court kind of cultivated it and the lower courts appreciated it because it, you know, they have these huge case loans. Uh, and these very complicated cases that they have to resolve under these huge caseloads, and so Chevron was kind of a godsend. The major questions doctrine, as I read it, is a doctrine for the Supreme Court. It's a doctrine that allows them, uh, as the highest court in the nation, to sort of invalidate certain agency initiatives that uh, strike them as being uh, dubious. Uh, but what's been lost here, uh, maybe inadvertently, is any sense for how is this gonna translate to the lower courts? How, how are a lower court judge is going to be able to manipulate these eight factors uh, or not manipulate them or, or, why, or do we really want an all things considered doctrine in this area when we got away from that uh, somewhat with the Chevron doctrine. So I, I don't know what the explanation is. I think the court has become very internally focused. It has this very small caseload uh, and so they can they have the luxury of spending infinite amounts of time uh, to, to get to the bottom of these cases. A very different situation in the lower courts. Uh, but the court's sense of having a responsibility to articulate doctrines that make sense for lower court judges uh, seems to be missing in action lately. I guess I'm, can I just, I'll just jump in and say, I guess I don't share the view that the lower courts are going to be hesitant to invoke the major questions doctrine. Um, that judge, I keep calling him judge, but then judge, Justice Kavanaugh invoked it in the D.C. Circuit, and it didn't seem to, you know, the fact that the Supreme Court hadn't, you know, sort of fully articulated, I don't think stopped him. And, and he wasn't alone. And, and I think he was right. You know, I think I, that that's, this is net neutrality was a major question. Doctrine. And Judge Janice Rogers Brown joined him. So I don't I'm not sure that uh, this is a, I don't see why um, this isn't a tool for uh, for any judge um, to 
to use when that judge thinks it's appropriate. And, I, and so the court may have, I don't know one way or the other whether the court articulated initially as a tool for them, but I don't share your skepticism that the lower courts will invoke it. Thank you. And I certainly would pleasantly, you know, with enthusiasm, urge them to on behalf of my client <laughs> to be, you know, to be clear. I don't intend to be shy about it. So. Hi, Will Trackman with Mountain Sites Legal Foundation out in Colorado. Agencies do a lot of things besides traditional rulemaking. They issue public statements. They issue sub-regulatory guidance. They might list endangered species that can affect millions of acres. And of course, uh, do any number of other things. Is there a reason why the major questions doctrine would apply differently to those sorts of agency actions that aren't traditional rulemaking? And if so, what would the differences be? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I've had that question asked to me. I, I don't see any reason why it would apply differently outside the context of, um, you know, regulate formal regulation. It, the agency has to interpret a statute in the course of an adjudication or an informal adjudication. I mean, there are all sorts of, as you say, all sorts of situations where the agency has to interpret its authority. And uh, again, if you view this as kind of a, a layer on top of how we do statutory interpretation, that's going to come into play in all those situations, not only in, in rules. I don't know if others disagree, but that's how I see it. No, no, I agree with that. And I think that's because I just read the case as having a more just general textual instruction about how statutory authority is supposed to be interpreted and not necessarily as the court trying to wade into the Chevron framework. Of course, the Chevron framework did have a lot of rules about how formal did the action have to be before Chevron deference would apply before we'd be in that framework. But because I don't see the court as situating major questions necessarily within that lens and that package, I think absolutely it should cause agencies to be concerned in adjudication, imposing penalties, sub-regulatory guidance, whatever else they're doing, to not claim um, authority that is not apparently derived from the text of the statute um, in any circumstance. One question that's come up in some discussions I've participated in is, uh, if this applies to agency decisions, why doesn't it apply to judicial decisions? Uh, I think Massachusetts versus EPA was a major question of uh, political and economic significance. Uh, the Bush administration wanted to modestly interpret the Clean Air Act uh, with respect to climate change, and the Supreme Court reversed them and said, no, you've got to aggressively interpret this uh, statute that way. Um, what about uh, Bostock versus uh, Clayton County that says that the Title VII applies to uh, uh, sexual orientation and transgender status? That seems to me like a major question. Uh, maybe the Supreme Court should uh, think a little bit about whether this doctrine applies to their own decisions. <laughs> Over here. Hi, this is Nathaniel Lawson. And, uh, this is me, more towards, do I pronounce it right, Mr. Gershengorn? Um, 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 though it is to, uh, to all of you. Um, you had, but Mr. Gershengorn, you had serious worries about the major question doctrine and how vague it is and how it's making courts do in, in analysis of things that aren't necessarily traditional statutory interpretation stuff. Um, I guess, um, what is the, um, what is a better alternative? I mean, you could say just no deference to anyone and I would support that. Um, 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 but even then, it, it that doesn't necessarily get to the real issue of um, should are there some things that the agency that we want Congress to be deciding rather than agencies like if if there an agency decided to try to say make um, the U.S. single um, do a single payer healthcare system would we be okay with that um, 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 or should we we want Congress to do that if an agency decided to say um, no, you're not allowed to use gas and coal for electricity generation. Would we be okay with that, or if, if, or would we want Congress to decide that? And but then, the, but then if we we don't well, uh, we, that's enough hypotheticals. <laughs> but I mean, but then, but I mean, but then there are plenty of things we would be okay with agencies doing. We're not, we don't want. Um, uh, um, uh, most people don't um, um, nowadays. Not me, but uh, most um, do think that Congress. There's just too much stuff go go the government does for Congress to do it all, and so want so want to put it off on a lot of it on the agencies. 
So where you draw it, the wait line. Wait a minute. Is, you have a question? Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> so like, where, how would you draw the line between what is that type of thing that is that that we don't want agencies to do versus the type of thing we are okay with agencies doing? Um, beside, because it doesn't seem right, like a uh, sort thank of standard. You. you can have anything other than a thank sort of vague standard. I don't so. mean to be rude, but we have limited time. Oh, sorry. So, uh, Mr. Gershman, Gordon, did you have? A, um, yeah, I mean, I just to be clear, I don't think I articulated that I thought this was bad. Or I, there were some things that troubled me about it, but I'm you know thinking through. I guess the thing I would say is, you know, there is an alternative. I'm not saying I'm. I'm not subscribing to it one way or the other. So I just like, but there is an alternative and Justice Kagan articulated it, right? I mean, what Justice Kagan said was, the things that have troubled the court are where agencies are going outside of their expertise, that the problem isn't bigness, the problem is expertise. And that if you have uh, the FDA, which is really good at figuring out what's harmful, deciding, whether cigarettes are a good idea or not, that's not what they do, right? They're not, that's not what they're for. And, and so for her, the EPA regulation is, you know, it, it either rises or falls on that. I suppose you could lose it even under her standard, I guess. But, you know, what she says is the way I read those previous cases is not a question of delegation, non-delegation. It's a question of agency straying outside their expertise. So whether that's good or bad, I, I don't know. I leave that to, to that's what you guys are supposed to think about as a result of the panel. Um, but I don't think it's the, you know, the alternatives are not, the, the two alternatives are not major questions or agencies can create, you know, single payer healthcare systems, right? There's a lot in between that. And obviously Justice Kagan's view, I mean, it's just a, a fundamental view that what Justice Kagan thinks is that, you know, when Congress has that Congress is busy and Congress doesn't have expertise on a lot of stuff. And, and there are a lot of things that have to be done. And so like as a matter of what Congress would have wanted um, and as a matter of what she thinks should be done, the, the default is once they pass the statute, the agency does it, the president signs off on it, and then you, you, run, you, you um, vote the president out of office. Like that's her view. And she's written about it in not only court opinions, but you know, academic papers. Um, you know, that's obviously not the only view and not the view the court held. But, you know, I, th I think it's, there are certainly in-betweens between, you know, from like the major questions doctrine is great to therefore agencies can, you know, cr do what Congress didn't, uh, you know, I mean, that's what I'd say. That's okay. Can, I, can, I, can I just add, can I add on to, to that? I, it, it seems to me that's just a real misdiagnosis of what the problem is. I mean, the problem is not, as I see it, um, the fact that agencies are doing things that they don't have expertise over. The problem is that they're using that expertise as itself a source of authority to make decisions instead of working through the political process. And you know, if you use your FDA example, if FDA decides tomorrow, you know, smoking should be prohibited because it's the expert and it says we think it's bad. You know, the problem with that would not be that they're, they don't have the scientific expertise to make that call. It's that it's not their call to make, at least without being given some source of authority by Congress. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> okay, over here. Uh, thank you. James Lee, young lawyer, uh, Judge Jones fanboy, law clerk. Uh, quick question for the panel. Uh, a lot has been said about uh, the ambiguity or the, the clarity, rather, of, of the framework. What about our ability to model language to determine ambiguity? Uh, for instance, now more than ever, we, we have things like corpus linguistics. We have jurists actually weighing in on what is the definition of ambiguity. Is it 50-50, 60-40, 70-30? Uh, does that... Does the, does the court's recent change, in other words, making Chevron a, a less discreet, a less clear framework, make more sense in light of recent developments improving our ability to study ambiguity? Uh, uh, Judge Kavanaugh, when he was on the DC Circuit, wrote an article in the Harvard Law Review in which he attacked the idea of clarity or clearness as being uh, the threshold for deferring to agencies under the, uh, the Chevron doctrine. Um, uh, the major questions doctrine does not escape from that problem. All it does is flip it on its head. Uh, uh, the Chevron doctrine says that uh, if the statute's not clear, go with the agency. 
the major questions doctrine says you can't go with the agency if it's major unless it's clear. So we're still back in clearness land here, uh, which is one of the all-time uh, favorite fudge words of judges, uh, in my opinion. <laughs> uh, thank you, Judge Jones. Brian Bishop uh, from the uh, Stephen Hopkins Center for Civil Rights. In, in, a, uh, in a realm that is ruled by uh, aphorisms about uh, mice and, uh, and elephants and so forth, I'm wondering, and I think Tom Merrill hinted at it, isn't the, doesn't it remain that the important aphorism here still is that Congress hath the power to make laws, not legislators? I mean, just from a kind of conceptual framework, not that that answers the question or that it's a clear line, but I think it's an, as important as elephants and, uh, and uh, mice. That's John Locke's position, yeah. I mean, I think there has to be some kind of non-delegation doctrine in the background or else, you know, the system, the separation of powers doesn't work. The question is, um, how close are you going to supervise the delegations? Uh, uh, and, and when are you going to say that too much discretion is too much? Right. And Justice Scalia, I'll invoke him again, uh, uh, knew this case law very well and basically said, you know, we've never been able to figure out where to draw that line, so we shouldn't try. Uh, and I think there's some wisdom in that. Any other comments? I see nothing wrong with concluding a little bit early under the <laughs> circumstances, and I thank, for, thank you all very much. For the